Okay, so State of Play Under the Skin of the Modern Game is the brand new book from author Michael Calvin. Uh, Michael's been on the show with us before, speaking about the likes of Living on the Volcano and No Hunger in Paradise, just two of the titles you'll know Michael from. Uh, and he joins us again uh, this morning. Michael, good morning to you. Morning, Owen. How are you? Not too bad. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the book. It's a, it's a brilliant read. And I guess, uh, is it fair to say that the best summation of the book is a collection of human stories that tell the wider stories of a number of very, very important issues? I suppose so, yeah. I suppose it's you know, everything you wanted to know about modern football, but were afraid to ask in many ways. Hmm. Um, I've um, you know, purposely shone a, a light into some pretty deep crevasses, but... Hopefully, I've exposed the workings of some very good people in very trying circumstances. And, and you're right. What I've tried to do here is humanise the issues which confront modern, modern football and uh, articulate them through the eyes and the experiences uh, of those people who are dealing with those issues. So it's very, very broad, looking at all the major issues from concussion, mental health, you know, the intolerance of modern society, which is then reflected in modern football, racism, homophobia, and just the big picture about, you know, where is this game going? We may as well start with one of those important issues that you mentioned there, which is concussion. And it is quite striking that it is the very first chapter in the book. You get straight into it. There's no messing about here. It's called Martyr, the first chapter. And in it, you speak to Dawn Astle, who is the daughter of Jeff, who uh, died by CTE, uh, and there's some amazing detail in this because Dawn herself has a police background, I think, and she talks uh, about historical evidence of CTE in football, a 1958 article you mentioned about punch-drunk footballers, and then the death of Charlie Roberts in 1939 after a brain operation, and I think the common misconception is that we're only starting to discover now uh, the dangers of heading the ball in football, which is true, but that doesn't mean that heading the ball has only been a problem in football in the modern era. Yeah, there is real historical context. I think what I uh, it was a sort of a, you know, a, a double-edged occasion for me with with Dawn. Um, on a purely human level, it was one of those interviews. I don't know if you've ever done them, uh, and where you know the emotional bond is so strong and the subject matter is so um, tragic that you and the interviewee end up in in tears, which is what happened there. And it was a very powerful and profoundly moving. Um, experience to literally sit in Jeff Astle's seat in his lounge at home to be you know, literally focusing on him having scored the winning goal at Wembley a huge photograph of that of that moment on the wall and the place is suffused with his spirit you have his daughter then sharing the last 30 seconds in his life um, he choked to death on his own vomit in his front garden uh, on a family occasion, uh, died at 59. The coroner um, uh, said that he uh, uh, was a victim of an industrial injury, i.e. hitting a football. His descent was very sudden and very um, uh, disturbing. And there were elements of Hillsborough uh, in, 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 the, in the campaign that Dawn had to wage for the, the authorities to take her seriously. It took 14 years for really meaningful research, uh, research to be launched. I think the most telling thing about it was um, it's almost like the, the mundanity of it. Mm. Um, she has an exercise book, um, a, uh, you know, just the sort of thing that, you know, our, our kids would have plastic backed. And in there is about 400 uh, different names uh, annotated by her little thumbnail sketches of their lives. Now, those are all former footballers who have either, either died or are in the terminal stages of dementia. And that is the reality. That is the humanity of the issue. And uh, I found that very, very uh, you know, moving experience and something that hopefully, if people read the book, it will give momentum to her campaign. Uh, because I know it's, I suppose, one of the, one of the great things about doing a book is, is the immediate interaction you get with the reader. And uh, the book was uh, published uh, last week. And on that first day of publication, I had three former footballers, all in their early 40s, uh, contact me, basically saying, look, we've been concussed through our careers. We haven't been checked out. We're going to do so. So it's a very, very, um, I think, important social issue. And I think it's one which will ambush football going forward. I think we, we might well have 
some form of class action suit going forward in the way that the AFL did. Mm. And, the, and the real tragedy of this, Owen, is those footballers died without knowing they were footballers, without knowing the pure pleasure that they gave to strangers. And I think, again, that gives the humanity to the issue that I'm trying to seek throughout the book. Yeah, the, the Jeff Astle, the way you write it, it is, it's very heartbreaking. It's, it's a heartbreaking read. And um, like there's a very, very important line, I think, from Dawn in that first chapter where she says with a lot of these issues where there's a will, there's a way and sometimes it can get found and a solution can get found. But she says that there is a way here, but the authorities may not have the will. Yes, and, and you have to support her criticism when you look at how difficult it's been for her uh, to get a message across, but also the the arrogance and ignorance of the authorities when in, initially confronted by the um, the problem, um, they've essentially dismissed her. They promised things, they prevaricated, they didn't deliver, and also they just looked down at her. She had two letters initially in, in the wake of her father's death. She had two letters from the the football association. The first was from their lawyers warning about uh, the complications which, which would arise if legal action was taken. And the second was an offer, an insulting offer, of two tickets for an England friendly. One designated for her mother and the other one to be shared between the three sisters. And to see the disgust in, uh, sorry, yeah, to see the disgust in her face and to hear the her in her voice, that tells you, that told me a lot about, again, the flesh and blood that is in football. It's, it is a people business and it treats people appallingly. Mm. Well, what do you think justice would be for the families, and not just Don Astle and her family, but the justice for the other 400 people and their families that they've left behind? How would justice have? So in what form would it be in for them to feel satisfied? I think just tangible uh, progress. I don't think we're dealing with ambulance chasers here. What we're dealing with is people who've seen their nearest and dearest, their beloved, their, the local heroes the, of whom they were really proud, taken away from them. And there's a search for answers. You know, why, why has this occurred? let's make sure that other families don't suffer the same trauma. Now, that can only be done as a long-term process by um, you know, the development of a brain bank. You know, I know quite a few footballers are, are talking about donating their, their brains uh, when they pass. That is the sort of thing that needs to happen. There is more research going on globally, certainly in the States and in, in the UK, because at the moment CTE cannot be uh, distinguished uh, in living tissue. It, we have to wait until death. So research needs to be accelerated in that area. There are some very good people working on it. Dr. Willie Stewart, who actually did the post-mortem of, uh, of Jeff Astor's brain, um, you know, he discovered there that he, in his, in his estimation, uh, he, uh, uh, Jeff Astor's brain was that of a 90-year-old man, and he was 59. And I think also... It's so poignant that someone like Jeff Astle is involved in this because it's, it's one, it's a bit of a throwback to a former time. Local hero, lived in a club semi-detached house, um, had an old gold post um, holding up his, um, his washing line in the back garden. Yet when he died, the full force of the community's grief became apparent. There were people lining the, uh, the the route of the cortege. They were on the walls as he was born into the uh, church, trying just to touch his coffin. And so that, again, is, is something that um, is a reminder of the, the really deep emotional bonds that can be formed between a footballer and his or her public. Yeah, like you, you mentioned the fact that you can't actually detect CTE in living brain tissue, which is obviously a scientific barrier. But the one thing we do have is a player talking about how they feel after they had a ball or if they feel pain to speak about that pain. And 
you use the term misplaced machismo in the book, which I think is a great phrase in terms of describing the attitudes that there are in the dressing room. And this goes into a wider topic you explore quite well in the book in terms of the dressing room culture, the manliness, the bravado that exists, which is ultimately allowing footballers to try and cover up what they're feeling in a purely physical sense after they head the ball and repeatedly time and time and time again. Yes, yeah, as you as you say, it's not just about you know, the physical sensation of heading the ball. It's the culture around the admittance um, of of perceived weakness. Mm. You know, if you look at um, you know, the dressing room culture, is very harsh. It's very macho, and vulnerability is perceived to be weakness, and sensitivity is perceived to be weakness, and people cannot, uh, or, or they're almost informed subliminally that they cannot afford to to uh, show that weakness because it is you know a, a darwinian um, environment the, 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 the modern dressing room and then that leads to the point which i think in the book we look at someone like drew broughton mm. uh who is a, a journeyman uh foot, former footballer 22 clubs who's now working with young players and and to quote him you know he, he sits across the desk from young players in tears on a regular basis and we look at the modern footballer with a degree of awe and he's he's covered in this sort of celebrity stardust but let's try and strip that away and what you what you see and, and there's a very good example that drew gives um no names no patrol because of you know, obviously you know professional clinical confidentialities but he, he works with a uh, an england under 21 international uh, if you look at him and you judge him by his media social media profile, he's living the dream. He's got the bling, he's got the street smarts, but actually, and he's got the money, but actually this is a boy, and he is still a boy in a man's world, who cries himself to sleep each night. He watches constant YouTube videos of Ronaldinho on the loop to see if he can get better. Yeah, he's got a manager who basically asks him, well, what's your problem? You've got, you've got the money, you've got the contract, you've got the talent. Why are you worried? Why are you stressing? And that old school approach then leads on to the other, one of the other issues in the book, which is this whole idea of modern management. Uh, you know, that, to me, is probably exemplified by Gareth Southgate in terms of being empathetic and emotionally intelligent. And, uh, you know, in the World Cup, in the build, build up to the World Cup, he had the courage to say to his players, be yourselves. And um, we had them, so for instance, someone like Danny Rose coming out, talking eloquently, passionately about things that he's experienced racism, gun crime. Now, I've been around the England team a long time, too long, to be perfectly honest, and it's, it's usually a, a day pass to, to Camp Paranoia. <laughs> but I, I tell you one thing, that would not have happened in the past, and I think that's really important. And uh, if, I, if we have to look at the other side of the ledger, I'll give you one name, Jose Mourinho. In terms of instilling this sort of old school uh, sense of bravado in the dressing room the the sense of bravado that can sometimes lead in quite in evidence in chapter two in your book of uh, an england 21 player crying themselves to sleep because their manager for example looks at his social media profile looks at his flashy car and says well everything's fine in your life i can say whatever i like to you yeah that's true that um, that player doesn't play for jose Mourinho, but i was no, using Mourinho not. to make the point um the you know, here is someone who uh, exemplifies the old school, command and control, do as I say, and, you know, the imposition of authority from above without sensitivity. So we have the example very recently with Anthony Martial, where, you know, he is fine because he makes the entirely human rational decision to stay with his partner following childbirth. Now, what, what message does that send out to his teammates in that dressing room? That when you've got, and, and you know, a lot of them are fathers. When you've got that lack of sensitivity, um, it has to have an effect in terms of the respect 
uh, that you have for the person who's your boss, essentially. Mm. And I think also if you look at, um, you know, where we're going um, globally in, in management terms, I, I, I tend to think that you look at North America and you see some trends which might come over this side of the Atlantic in the next sort of five to ten years. So if you look at AJ Hinch, who's the, the manager of the reigning World Series baseball champions, the Houston Astros, you know, here's a guy who's got a degree in psychology from Stanford. Yeah. You have players in the F NFL who are measuring their brain waves. So the human condition is becoming a, an essential part of modern sport and inevitably modern football. 